question. What makes a church a church? Well, last week I said that a church is a group of people who take evangelism very seriously. As Rachel was reading for us, you can see that Peter preaches the gospel. And in verse 37, he says that people's heart, hearts were pierced. As a result, you can see in verse uh, 41 that those who heard the gospel, they believed. In other words, another special mark about a healthy church is true conversion. Because you can join a church on a Sunday, you can join a gathering, but that doesn't make you a Christian, right? What makes you a Christian is that your heart was pierced. Those who believe that what Peter said were baptized and added to the church that day. So last week I said that another important mark of a healthy church is baptism and membership. Both things go hand in hand. Baptism and membership. That's why we take so seriously here membership. You are committing to one another. So last week we looked at three marks. Biblical evangelism, Biblical conversion and biblical membership. Today we're going to look at four other marks. And I'm very glad to have the kids at the front. Because when you go back to school, I want you to be able to explain to your classmates, to your teachers, why you gather with a bunch of people on a Sunday. You, I want you to be able to explain to them what the church is. So today we're going to be looking at Four other marks. We're going to focus on verse 42 in order to do that. So that's the plan. Let me now pray, asking the Holy Spirit to be helping us here. Because it's easy to get distracted, isn't it? It's easy for us not to listen to God's word. And I want to be used here as his messenger. And I want you to open your heart and receive this message in a, in a powerful way, in a way that your heart may be transformed. I keep saying here over and over again, if you come in here just to get information, you're wasting your time. The reason why we gather here together is for the Word of God to transform our heart. So we're looking for transformation. So let me pray, asking the Holy Spirit to transform our hearts today. Father God, we thank you so much for your son. We thank you for his sacrifice. We thank you for the Bible. And we thank you, Holy Spirit, to be our helper. Would you please help us right now to focus would you please remove the distractions that we all have in our minds? Would you please remove from our hearts things that do not belong to your kingdom so that we may value what we're going to be listening to. We may love you as the most important one in our lives. Help us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me read verse 42 once again. So this is the beginning of a church. All the believers devoted themselves. All the believers, they dedicated their lives to what? Well, number one, to the apostles' teachings. Why are they devoting themselves to the apostles' teachings? Well, let's understand what an apostle is, first of all, right? They are, they are devoting themselves to the apostles. Okay, the word apostle just means someone sent out with a mission. Some of those deci disciples here, they were devoting themselves to the apostles, those who were following Jesus. These are very special apostles. Why? Because they walked with Jesus. They saw Jesus. They were taught by Jesus himself. And Jesus, before 
he ascended to heaven. He gathered his disciples and he told them, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them everything I have commanded. So what are the disciples? I mean, the disciples of Jesus, the apostles doing now? They are teaching everything they have learned to these new disciples who heard Peter preaching the gospel. And they devoted themselves to it. So here's the first lesson for us. An important mark of a healthy church is a church that devotes itself to the teachings of the Bible. God speaks when we open the, this book and listen to his voice. Isn't that mind blowing? That God speaks to any of us. You just need to open this book. And a church that values it, it's a healthy church. I don't know about you kids, but when I was a child, my mom, and she's here, she can, she can let you know later if that is the truth or not. She would give me vitamin supplements. She would give me vitamin D so my bonds could get stronger and stronger. And she would give me vitamin C so I could have my immune system boosted. And that's what the Word of God does. It's like a vitamin that, that gives us, nurtures, it strengthens us, and at the same time boosts our immune system against false teaching. Unfortunately, there are a lot of churches that does, does not take this book as seriously as we should. They make up teachings that do not reflect what it is in this book. So this is a very important mark for all of us. And that's why I ask you kids to sit at the front. I need you to be fed with the Word of God. I need you to take this to be protected, and at the same time, to be nurtured, fed. So biblical teaching is very important. But what do I mean by biblical teaching? Well, number one, I'm talking about knowing this book, not guessing what this book has to say. Does it make sense what I'm saying, kids? I don't want you to guess what it is written in this book. I want you to know. This is why it's so important to read it, not only on Sunday, but every single day. It's about knowing, not just about guessing what the Bible has to say. Secondly, biblical teaching is about submitting to what the Bible has to say. Because one thing, you should know it, right? The other thing is to say, I want this for me. I, I accept this as the truth. So one thing is to know it. The other thing is to submit to it instead of just submitting to what pleases you. Because I've seen this many, many times. We Christians, we are good at it, aren't, aren't we? I submit to the Bible, but not this part here. I'm going to skip it. No, 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 no. Uh, I like this. Yeah, I'm going to submit to this. I like this. But, but not this part here. No, no, no. Let me actually let me hide it. So I'm talking about biblical teaching, submitting to everything that is in here. Everything. So it's about knowing. It's about submitting to it. And thirdly, it's about obeying it. You can know it. You can even tell yourself, I mean, it's the truth. I'm going to submit to it but you don't put into practice. So biblical teaching is about knowing, submitting, and obeying. No matter the cost. It's hard, isn't it? To put this book into practice? Very difficult. Very difficult. It can be costly. But it's what gives us strength. To keep going. Not the lies out there. 
They are going to destroy us. <laughs> this is like vitamin. Take it. Don't ignore it. Second mark, it's ooh, biblical fellowship. That's also in verse 42. All the believers devote themselves to the apostles' teachings and to fellowship. What does that mean? Well, this word here in the original means having a deep sense of community, a love for one another. So again, let's get this context here. Jesus told his disciples, you will be my witness. Peter preaches the gospel. People hear the gospel. Their hearts are pierced. They believe, they repent, they get baptized, they are added to the church. Now they are devoting themselves to the apostles' teachings and they have fellowship. They learn how to love one another. And this is something very important, but something that unfortunately we are losing, right? I found out recently that the number of the so-called de-churched, those who believe in Jesus but they don't want anything to do with the church, is just increasing. If it was a country, it would be the fifth biggest country in the world. Can you believe in that, kids? People who follow Jesus but they don't devote themselves to the fellowship, they don't like Jesus' people. They like Jesus, they don't like Jesus' people. They don't like to have fellowship with other believers. They don't want to love one another as they are meant to love. They don't want to love one another as Jesus loves us. But fellowship is an important and essential mark of a healthy church. And why? Well, yesterday, you know, I'm a Brazilian. I love my meat. I love barbecue. The weather is ideal. And I decided to just get some meat. And I prepared my grill. And I put the charcoal inside. And oh, it was beautiful. You could, you could feel the heat. Is that right, Hannah? You were very close. You, you, I could not allow the kids to get close. It was warm. Ready to cook my meat. When the meat was cooked, what did I do? I began to put away the coals. Why? To cool it down. Why am I sharing this with you? Not to make you feel angry. <laughs> Just to use this as an analogy. You see, we are like coals. If we are together, oh, you're going to see how powerful we are, how warm we are. But from the moment we are not together anymore, we get cold. We don't want to be cold. <laughs> we want to love one another in the same way Jesus loves us. But what does actually fellowship mean? Biblical fellowship. Well, let me give you three Number one, biblical fellowship is about loving one another despite our differences. One of our values here should be an intercultural church. In other words, it is hard to have fellowship with people who do not look like you. I, I tend to define culture as the way we do things because we believe it's the best way of doing it. And from the moment you start interacting with people who have a different way of doing things, Ah, it gets harder to love one another. That's what biblical fellowship is. You put aside your cultural preferences to love people again in the same way Jesus loves us. Secondly, biblical fellowship is about caring for one another without, without losing enthusiasm. Because I've seen this as well in churches. We began caring for one another and people don't care for us in the same way. 
and we soon lose enthusiasm. We say, you know what, I'm not going to care about, about those people anymore. They don't care about me. But that's not, that's not biblical fellowship. You care for others despite, despite the way they care for you. You keep Jesus in mind. Jesus looked after us. He cared for us, even though we were his enemies. So we do it to bring glory to him, not to receive anything back. We care for others, whether they care for us or not. Thirdly, biblical fellowship is about serving one another to see a spiritual growth. A Sunday gathering like this is not a show. The reason why we gather together is to help one another to grow spiritually. Find ways to serve those who are part of your church. Find ways to help them to become more like Jesus. Take the responsibility. What can I do today to help someone? What can I do during the week to help someone to become more like Jesus? So biblical fellowship is about loving one another, caring for one another, and serving one another. That's, that's another important mark. But there's a third one. Verse 42 says that, all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings, to fellowship, and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper. I'm going to skip this one now. I'm, I'm going to leave this mark for the end, okay? I want you to look at this other mark. And to prayer. Okay? So they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings, to fellowship, and to Prayer. And why are they doing it? Well, they are doing it because their Lord did it. Jesus spent a lot of his time praying, praying to the Father. Now the disciples are doing the same. This young church is devoting to prayer. Another essential mark of a healthy church. A mark that we need to take into account very seriously. A few days ago, Alon and I, we decided to take a day just for, for both of us. So we spent the day together. And I don't know if she was paying attention, but we spoke for seven hours without stop. I was like, wow. We've known each other for over 20 years. We've been married for over 20 years, and we still have a lot to talk about. Seven hours without a break. Oh, for us, that was a break anyway. <laughs> and it was great. It was great. So when I talk about prayer, I'm talking about talking to someone we love, Jesus. I'm not talking about a religious tradition. I'm talking about open your heart to the one you love with pleasure. And the disciples, this new church that devoted themselves to talk to Jesus with joy in their hearts, not because they had to do it. They didn't get bored. So what do I mean by prayer here? What do I mean by biblical prayer? Why is that a, an important mark? Well, biblical prayer is about open your heart to Jesus. Not repetition, okay? I know, I know some people think that prayer is about repetition. No, it's a conversation with the one you love. You open your heart. Because you have a relationship with him. Secondly, biblical praise about humbling yourself before Jesus. 
You're not doing it because you want to twist God's arm to do what you want. Does it make sense what I'm saying? Some people think prayer is all about petition, asking him to give what you want. And because you want something so much, you start talking to him. But not because you want to have a relationship with him. You do it because you're like, come on, God, give me what I want. There is no relationship. You treat him in a business way, in a transactional way, not in a relational way. So biblical praise about opening your heart, humbling yourself before Jesus, and spending time with him as you do with those you love. If I could spend seven hours talking to Aluana, how much more should I be spending with the one I love the most, right? And as you do it, it gets easier, easier, and easier. A very important mark. Another mark is communion. And that's my last mark for today, okay? Next week we've got four more marks. But let me stop at, with this one. Verse 42 again. All oh, the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings and to fellowship and sharing in news, including the Lord's Supper. What does that mean? Oh, in summary, before Jesus died on the cross, he gathered his disciples and they had a meal together. In, and during that meal, he turned to his disciples and he took some bread and he broke the bread and he says, this is my body, which is broken for you. In other words, on the cross, his body was broken for us. He took the cup with wine and he said, this is my blood. In other words, this is going to be shared for you as a sacrifice. Do this in remembrance of me. Celebrate the Lord's Supper, communion, to remind yourself about a sacrifice. What sacrifice are you talking about, Alex? Oh, Jesus, he died on a cross. Not because he was a criminal. Kids, what did Jesus do to deserve death on a cross? Painful. What did he do? Did he disobey his parents? Did he rebel against the Roman Empire? What did he do? He might be a bad person to die that way. What did he do? For our sins. And what is sin? Sin is a rebellion against this good God. It's to use your freedom to do whatever you want, not take into account what God wants. It should do whatever you want, not taking not, not, not take into account the consequences of your choices. We all rebelled against God, right? We all said we don't want you. You made us, you love us, but we hate you. We don't like you. We don't, we don't like what you, you want us to do. We, we don't want to do what you want you want us to do. We want to be our own gods. And what do we deserve? Oh, we deserve death. Separation from God. If we don't want God, the result of it is separation, isn't it? To be disconnected from Him. But He is the source of life. He's the one who sustains life. And this is the problem of sin. Sin leads to death. Eternal death. Eternal suffering. Because if he is good and we are far away from what is good, guess what? By rebellion against him, we choose suffering for all eternity. But God is so good. 
For God so loved the world that instead of destroying us, He sent His Son to take upon Himself our sin. And when He gathered His disciples and He says, This is my body which is broken for you. This is my blood which is shed for you. He was saying, I will take it. I will take it. Not because you deserve. Not because you're good. Because Jesus is good. That's why he's saying, when you gather together, church, remind one another of that. This is very important. When you celebrate communion, take it very seriously because it points to Jesus' sacrifice. So it's a very important mark of the healthy church. And you need to understand it in order to take part of it. When I was a child, and again, I'm going to say that again, I love meat. When I was a child, my parents left me with some relatives in a different state in, in Brazil. Um, they offer me a steak, oh, and I can't refuse it. But I've made the mistake of not asking, not asking where that steak came from. I had it, they all look at me, some of them were laughing, and I was wondering, why are they laughing? Why are they looking at me? And they asked me, Alex, did you like it? Yes, that's really nice. Do you know what it is? I said, cow? No. They took me to the kitchen, opened the fridge, kids. And inside of the fridge, there was a monkey head. Ugh! Can't believe I had this. When we take communion, we need to understand. Because I don't want you to regret taking it, not knowing what communion is. Communion is about Jesus' sacrifice. I don't want you to look back and think, oh, I took part of that, and now I understand how silly I was when I participate of something without not knowing how serious that is. So biblical communion is about understanding the real meaning of Jesus' sacrifice. It's about celebrating his sacrifice with clear conscience. Oh, Jesus died for me. And I'm doing it to remind myself of how gracious he is, how loving he is, how good he is. So it's about understanding, celebrating, and expecting his return with joy. We're going to be celebrating the Lord's Supper today, communion. And we'll do it with joy in our hearts, knowing that soon the one who died on the, on the cross for us, he'll come back. Because he still, he, he leaves. He'll come back to gather his church. So what, may, what comes to your mind when you hear the word church? What comes to the minds of those out there with your friends, your classmates, your co-workers, your neighbors? I know they have a lot of negative Answers for that to that question. A lot. But the church is not perfect. This is one of the things you need to understand and you need to under, uh, help your friends to understand. The church is not perfect. Therefore, it's not the perfect group of people. The church is not perfect because Jesus welcomes only imperfect people. If you think you are perfect, good, you find the perfect, good church. 
I think it was Spurgeon who used to say that. Don't join that church because you are imperfect and you're going to bring imperfection to the church. So we need to help our friends to understand that, yes, the church has made a lot of mistakes. But because Jesus welcomes only imperfect people. And while we are here, we're going to make mistakes. However, that's not an excuse for us. We need to work hard to make our church a healthy church. That's why those marks are so important. That's why evangelism is so important to us. We need to communicate the gospel properly. That's why biblical conversion is so important to us. We don't allow people to believe they are Christians when they are not. <laughs> That's why we take membership so seriously here. That's why the teachings of the Bible is so important to us. That's why fellowship is so important. That's why prayer is so important. That's why communion is so important to us. We are a group of imperfect people, but we want to work hard to become a healthier church. Let me pray, and as I pray, I want you to search your heart. I want you to ask God to be removing from your heart everything that might not be helping you to have a good relationship with Jesus and with those around you. And maybe you're not committed to the church, Jesus' body. Today, I want you to search your heart and try to identify the reasons why you're not committed to Jesus' body. What are the things that are stopping you from having proper fellowship with other brothers and sisters? Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the Bible and we thank you for the opportunity to gather together again to listen to your voice. As we search our hearts right now, would you please help us to identify idols that are blocking our relationship with you, idols that are separating us from your body, the church. Help us to take those marks that we looked at here today more seriously, Father, so we can bring glory to your name. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.